It's a joy for me, and I, I'm sure it's a joy for everyone here to be together, to pray together, to reflect, and to vibrate together under this marvelous protection of the benevolent spirits who, in name of God, in name of Christ, they are here to sustain us, they are here to inspire us in our reflections of the day which will be about our ways to our light, to God's light. Well, Haroldo Dutra Dias, once in a lecture, he said that if we could only read all the forewords Emmanuel has written through Chico Xavier, we would have lessons enough for a life. In the four words to the book Liberation, Emmanuel tells us that André Luiz, the spirit author, uh, he shows us in this book such important knowledge. Uh, and he shows us, he presents us um, the divine service, the Christian service, as our doors, our free access doors to the light, to our enlightenment. And Emmanuel goes on by drawing a parallel between André Luiz and the little redfish. That's for you, Julia. The little redfish, it's a well-known tale uh, which have been presented in so many variables, including the blockbuster Nemo. Yes? Okay. This is how Emmanuel begins his foreword by saying, in the center of a beautiful garden, in the waters of a big lake, all adorned with blue tiles, there live the little redfish. The lake, the lake was fed by a narrow rock channel and it uh, drained its waters to the other side through a very narrow grid. That would be a cozy haven for the little fish to live. If it weren't the big and strong fishes who mistreated him, so he couldn't find any fun he couldn't find any joy there, so he decided to study hard, and he opted for a change. He decided to move out, and he endured great suffering, but he could finally manage his way out through the narrow grid that he had to pass. So he was now in new landscapes, flowers, the sun. And he was amazed and he lived it there, out there, full of hope. Till one day, till one day he remembered the other fishes that he has shared his childhood with. And he feel sorry for them feel compassion for them. So he decided to go back and help their salvation. So the little fish was helped by the good-hearted fellows that lived with him in the coral palace. So he could head out back to the lake. He crossed the narrow grid inside and began to search for his companions, his old companions. He was so animated with love that he thought that his return would cause a great enthusiasm among the other fishes. But no, they didn't even care. They continued their lazy routine. Truly, they had not even noticed that he had been absent for some time. And though despised, the little red fish 
he uh, tried to tell them, there is another world, guys. There is another world, liquid, glorious, marvelous, endless. He warned them, the lake is insignificant. It can disappear from one moment to the next. But he was not heard. Another word he told them, another experience way better than this one. A place where life is marvelous, is amazing, is rich. They did not pay attention. Most, they did not believe him. Well, Emmanuel concludes his foreword by saying, Andrea Louis' efforts are similar to the ones of the little redfish. Andrea Louis was amazed by his findings about the infinite ways for the spirits after death. And findings that he came by after hard personal sufferings. So he decides to return to us and tell us, hey, giving us examples, telling us true stories, telling us to show that beyond this tiny spot where we live now, there is another life, more intense, a real life. However, Emmanuel warns us that the passage to this more intense spiritual life are of a narrow kind. And it takes us, man, genuine efforts for our individual improvement. And Andrea Luiz informs us how. Andrea Luiz writes books and books through the mediumship of Chico Xavier. However, Emmanuel says, there are many human fishes that laugh and pass, scornful, indifferent. They, yes, they want a paradise after death. But truly, they want a free paradise. They would rather a free paradise. Andrea Luiz had not been the first spirit, nor the last, to undertake the role of the little red fish of the spiritual world. He had not. Many other spirits, many other spirits authors, they uh, tried to bring us their teachings, telling us the reality of the spiritual life. In fact, we can say that the Spirit's revelations, they perpass our human history. More, they are the cause for Spiritism. This consoling, this instructive doctrine that we can use as a compass guiding our ways to the light. Let us tell a little about Spiritism now. Spiritism began in 1857, when the Spirit's book was published in France, and the content of the book was organized by Allan Kardec, pseudonym or pen name of Hippolyte Lyon de Nizar Vivayu, the um, French educator, uh, respected, prolific writer, uh, translator. Kardec was member of several learned societies, so we can say he was a man of a very practical and clear mind. At the age of 44, 54, uh, the skeptic Kardec at first was presented to the table turning, a phenomenon which was exciting the attention of Europe and the attention of America. A dear friend invited him to go and witness a table 
answering to questions that were proposed to it. And he went. But at first he did not believe. However, Kardec was a man of science. And soon he began to propose questions to the tables and getting answers. He even proposed questions in a language nobody uh, around the table knew. And the table answered. So Kardec soon perceived behind the turning table there was much more than he expected at first. He devised the real nature of those phenomena. There had to be an intelligent cause. And Kardec's hypothesis was proved very soon when the very table answered that it was not the table providing the answers, but the spirits of the people who died who were using the tables as a means of communicating with the people around it. After a couple of years, Kardec had his ideas and convictions changed by this, those conversations with the spirits, with the invisible. Yeah? And he was now able to compile thousands of questions and the answers given by the spirits and through several mediums, in several places, different places in Europe and North America. Those were questions about the nature and mechanisms of spirits, of spirits communications, the reasons for human life on Earth, life in the spirit realm, reincarnation, other philosophical and scientific subjects. Beyond the dancing tables, Kardec could devise an entirely new theory of human life, of human duty and destiny. Perfectly rational, coherent, lucid, consoling, and intensely interesting. This is what Kardec told his wife Emily before publishing the Spirit's book. And those subjects were organized by Allan Kardec first in the Spirit's book, and then he developed the subjects in four subsequential works, which are the Medium's book, The Gospel According to Spiritism, Heaven and Hell, and Genesis. And those five books are the fundamentals of Spiritism. Kardec always stressed it was not his work, it was the Spirit's work that he had proposed the questions and organized the questions. And we can tell this had been a Herculean work that he did the last 12 years of his life. Spiritualist religions and philosophies have their own principles and have their own practices. Although they all share two common beliefs, the belief in God, the belief in the mortality of the soul. And spiritism is inserted in this bigger picture of spiritualism. And spiritism also has its own principles and its own practices. And the fundamental principles for spiritism we can uh, say the fundamental are five, to resume. The existence of God, immortality of the soul, plurality of existences, reincarnation, plurality of the inhabited planets, communicability with the spiritual realm. Spiritist practices are the practice of prayer, Reflective study, what we are doing just now, okay? Laying on of hands or also called passes, and the practice of spiritual communication through mediumship, 
and the practice of charity, love in action. However, we must say we had no dogmas, we had no rituals, no hierarchy of any kind. And if I were running out of time now, and I would have to choose for us the principal message Spiritism has for us, that should be, oops, sorry guys, let me correct it here. Nobody dies. Nobody dies. Death does not exist. We will continue our life after this life here on earth. We will meet again, good. We will meet again here or in the spiritual plane. Bad. Not bad. And we can communicate with each other somehow. As for inspiration, spirits communicate with us through inspiration, through mediumship, during our dreams. And so that's so consoling. That's why we would say, this is the principal message, nobody dies, okay? And Spiritism is also consoling, because it shows us we are not the result of just one life. One life can't explain life. Spiritism tells us we have many lives, and this experience is just one episode of a long series. And uh, moreover, Spiritism gives us this assurance because it's not a theory that pop out or out of any man's mind. No, the dead themselves, the so-called dead themselves, they communicated in an organized manner back there in the 19th century. And they did before. And they still do, they continue doing. And what do they tell us? What do they tell us? Hey guys, here we are, here we are. We can communicate with you. Ah, uh, see how we live, pay attention. Most importantly, pay attention to our situation. So you can learn with our wrongs and doings. Or with our rights with our wrongdoings and also learn and repeat our, our, the things that we did that had a good result. So you can uh, find the better ways for your lives. Okay, many people were presented with the mediumistic phenomena back there in the 19th century, but not everyone observed them as Alain Kardec did. Alain Kardec could see in them therapeutic, therapeutic features and uh, beyond the evidences of life after death. Kardec saw in the instructions transmitted by the spirits a new and interesting theory, as he told Amélie. But it was not only interesting theory. It was a transformative information. Transformative information because it prompts us to shift our life philosophy, to make a shift in our life philosophy. Whereas immortality is now, has to be now associated with individual responsibility as a part of our daily life, not for once in a while, a part of our daily life. The question is for us, what would be the use of knowing that we had past lives? What would be the use of knowing what we had been, what we have done in previous reincarnations, if we do not know how to deal with those features from old lives that we still bring with us, we carry with us, and we know that we, know we need to remodel those futures. That was a very interesting point that Dr. Vanessa Anceloni 
treated in her lecture in 2010 in the Spiritist Congress in Valencia. And I brought here for us. And um, that's why Kardec, in the chapter 17 of the Gospel according to Spiritism, a chapter entitled Be Perfect, Kardec tells us that Spiritism needs to be thoroughly understood and above all, deeply and sincerely felt. Since the beginning, Kardec learned with the spirits that our happiness comes with our transformation and it takes hard work for that to happen because those are efforts to transform ourselves to the point of achieving the climax of Spiritism fundamentals, which is charity, love in action. And Kardec says, talking to the Spiritists, that the true Spiritists can be recognized by their moral transformation and by the efforts they employ in order to overcome their bad instincts. Their there is a moment, there is a moment in our life that we uh, recognize that we are walking into the wrong direction, ch uh, choosing wrong ways, and we decide to change. There is no point waiting at this time for a magic trick. They won't come. Magic tricks won't come. But there is a good trick. There is a good trick to begin with, which is prayer. Although our inner chains, for inner chains, we have a long way to go, a hard process, the good news for us is that we are never alone. No one is abandoned. We are individually cared by the high, by the benevolent spirits, by our guardian angel, and by Jesus himself, who we can say is the CEO of our humanity project. Let us use our reason when that time comes for us. Let us use our heart. Let us use our hands. Let us be mindful fighting the spiritual idleness, uh, escaping from the least effort that we tend to, and let us pray, and let us pray, and let us pray. And uh, it would be now worthwhile to remind the patron of our group, Paul of Tarsus, Paul had to walk the stairway of transformation, step by step, sometimes lost in anguishes and fears, and um, enchained by the old values, by the illusions, sometimes shadowed by the sorrow of the lost loves of his life. Nevertheless, Paul had always the protection of Stephen in his spirit, and of Jesus himself, always there, guiding him, supporting him in his mission. It had been painful for Paul. It won't be less for us, okay? If we are willing to change, we must be prepared to grieve to mourn sometimes. First, because letting go old habits, illusions that we had cultivated for so many time, for so, so long time, it's a painful process. Yes, it is painful. And Dr. Susanna Simon is an active spiritist in the USA, talking uh, at the Toronto Spiritist Society once said that in the initial moment of our uh, struggling for transformation, 
we feel like losing something. It's not real, she says, but we feel like losing something. But she says that the ones that are going to be able to transform themselves are the ones that can withstand these first moments so they can uh, cross to the other edge, to the other side. And then they will understand of all the things that they had actually gained, not lost, in this process of transforming themselves. So Paul faced the same pains, those same pains. Only when Paul started serving others without ego, uh, as an apostle of Christ, he could emerge to a more peaceful state of mind, to an expanded consciousness. And he was then in perfect intimacy with God. And he could be so aware of the good spirits around him, of Jesus guiding him all the time, that in a way that he got to know that we are never alone. And he wrote this to the Hebrews, in the letter to the Hebrews, when he told them, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. But there are more causes for grief. Another cause for grief in our transformation processing is that we have to face the, uh, the flaws in our character. And this situation, we need to revisit our past. We need to learn with our past. However, uh, we may feel guilt sometimes. We may feel guilt, and in, if that happens, there is only in the best advice. Let's not be stuck in the past. We need to move forward, always. We need to move forward. And so, let us see what Paul again tells us about this situation. When he wrote to the Philippians, he told that, no, he told uh, that we, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. So he told that to the Philippians. And that means that instead of being so judgmental with ourselves, we need to accept we are a work in progress, not any kind of work. We are God's work. We are God's work. Even though we may probably have some setbacks, God's work also has some setbacks. If that happens, we need to stand up again, move forward, and fight the good combat. And sometimes, um, Sometimes, no, always, in our transformation process, we have always to struggle. And Paul will struggle a lot with himself. And Paul's struggle is present in the letter he wrote to the Romans. And that sent he wrote to the Romans, it's so me. I don't know if it's you, it's so me. So let's see what he wrote to the Romans. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Oh my! Paul must have said that. And sometimes we'll even cry during these struggles of ours. We'll cry, and if we, if we have to cry, let us cry, okay? Crying is therapeutic, it's cleansing, 
It's, those are very important moments in our transformation process. And sometimes we cry because we cannot undo our past, isn't that? Well, in those times, we have to hold tight to spiritism that tells us we have the rest of our lives to build a better future. And does anyone here know how much, how long will be the rest of our lives? Forever. We are immortal spirits. The rest of our life will be forever. So we can say that tears are blessed. When they help us, when they put us in this way to expand our consciousness, okay? in this process of expanding our consciousness. And um, let's see here. In the Spirit's book, in the question 1009, it's written there. Suffering comes to make us dislike the outcome of certain choice due to a false movement of the soul. Well, when a ship makes a false movement, the captain goes and takes the best decision to put the ship in the right route again, isn't it? Well, the question for us is, is our life adrift somehow? Are we making wrong movements? taking wrong ways? Have we been too proud once? Have we been too impatient? Have we been too indif indifferent? Etc. Etc. Well, the list of our false movements of our soul, it's a long list. Yes, it's a long list. However, Let's reflect together. If we are discussing this topic, we can be sure it's already the moment to take the resolution and work for rehabilitating our souls, ourselves. How do we do this right now? Caring for every next thought caring for every next action. Every next little step must be cared if we are beginning in our process of transformation. Because what we are building up step by step, we are building up love in us and around us. Okay? We are writing a new story every day. So, once we know Spiritism, we are invited to choices accordingly to Spiritism. We, we have to think that Spiritism tells us our lives today are the result of our past choices. Our happiness here in this world and our happiness as immortal spirits depends on the choices we make now. So, depends on us always abiding to this universal law of love. So, if, even though uh, at this point we can say there is no going back for us, okay? We came to, in our process of self-transformation, we came to the point of no return, okay? The point of no return, and so any, each movement of our soul should answer beforehand, does this serve me as an spirit, as a mortal spirit? Does this serve me as a mortal spirit? Well, for sure, we'll make wrong moves. We'll do. No problem. 
Let's copy the video game players around us. What do they do when they do they make any wrong move? Reset button, restart again. Reset button, restart again. We can restart again. We have this power to, to restart again. And it is what Leon Denis tells us in when he was talking about the powers of the soul. Leon Denis tells us that will allow us to put the internal powers working and aiming at a superior goal. And then Leon Denis also tells us that we can accomplish all things in the psychic domain by using our will, directing our thoughts to a chosen objective, to a set a goal that we set for ourselves. Okay, it is a gradual pro process, for sure it is a gradual process, because that's how evolution, evolution ha happens, okay? Gradually, gradually. What happens to us is that we like immediate results. If we do not have the answers right away, what happened to us? We get anxious. Yes, we get anxious. Let me give you a good, a good example. For us, Brazilian is a very good example. I don't know if Canadians also do as Brazilians do, but we like to take good decisions on January 1st. Yes? Yes? Okay. So, the year passes, and there comes December 31st. Nothing changes. What happened to us? We lose our heart. Oh my, I will never lose those pounds. Oh, that thousand pages book, I'm still in the introduction. So we lose heart. We think we, we can never do. Let me tell you a story. Once, in a moment of a great dismay, great uncertainty, many regrets. Who has not those moments? Who has not those moments? Regrets, uncertainty, okay? Well, Paul was in such a moment. Uh, Paul had just been shut off his father's life. His father has repelled him. So Paul walks out of town, chooses a place of solitude, and Paul, in an ardent prayer, Paul asks Jesus the remedy for his suffering. And Paul, in that moment, got the best advice of his life. An advice that he kept for life and helped him in all the moments of the hard times he had. And that advice we are going to take for us today. Okay? He was told to love first. To abide to Jesus' message of love. To give love unconditionally because love is, it, it, it is love that makes us strong. It is the love that we had given that comes back to us in our most difficult situations. When Paul was to take the boat to Rome for his last trial, a crowd came to the shore supporting him, adoring him as his benefactor, as their benefactor. Paul, he who had been their persecutor, years before, and that crowd brought him such a joy, a tremendous joy that surmounted 
the big suffering that that time was being for him. So, Paul was also told to work, to do works of good, collaborating with the message of love, to uh, conquer most human hearts. Because there is a reason that helps us doing this in our transformation. Because while we dedicate ourselves with enthusiasm to others, change happen in our inside, in our intimacy. And our soul is being transformed. Isn't that that we want? Be a different soul, better one? More beautiful? Well, what makes our spiritual superiority is just that. Is the, the capacity that we develop to struggle and to sacrifice not only for us, but for others too. And uh, what we are working for in our life is that we are working for building up love. Love charity. Okay? And our ultimate goal is love God, love the others, and love ourselves. That's what we are building up in our soul. Paul was also told to wait and to forgive. Let forgive stay there. Wait with hope. Okay? Wait in the moments of discouragement, when there are no answers. And trust there is a divine program for our lives. And we have to trust there is a divine program for our lives. But we are not going to wait for this divine program to happen. Active. We must be active. Doing all the efforts to the limit of our strengths. So that divine program can happen in our lives. Despite the circumstances. And the good fruits will come. We can trust if we do like that. And the last piece of advice is the easiest one. Forgive. Oh my, forgive. And we have to forgive with understanding. We try to understand it's easier to forgive. Okay? When we can't find echo among people, when we find indifference from the others towards our work in the good path, we have to remember that piece of advice. Forgive with understanding. Paul followed this plan all his life, and it really helped him. Paul dedicated himself patiently to the others. He never provoked situations. He was always tolerant with ignorance and also with others' weaknesses. And ultimately, Paul was always forgiven. Why Paul was always forgiven? Because he had been forgiven by Christ's compassion with him. Who has not been forgiven by God's and Christ's compassion? Okay? That's why we have to take the same advice for us. So the path to inner transformation, to that point in time where we have developed the highest consciousness, it takes love, it takes work, it takes patience, it takes us confidence in God, and it takes us developing this capacity of forgiveness. Let us always Know that our inner transformation will come step by step, but will come with hope in our hearts. Will come with a clear goal in our minds. And let's hold on to this faith that there, there is a divine program for us, for our lives. And let us be inspired in post-transformation. And uh, let's follow the message of love, ultimately. Until we are finally free. Free of what? Free of ourselves. Okay? Until we get the reward 
of this expanded consciousness that is that we always aim and this conscious in peace and we can also help the others around us in this way to happiness. So when we talk about inner transformation, we, our aim is always perfection. The relative perfection, of course, the relative perfection that all of us are destined to. So, I couldn't find a better way to conclude our reflection today, other than Kardec, Kardec's comments in the same chapter 17, Be Perfect, where Kardec tells us this. Oh my. Oops, sorry, again. There will be something here very important for us. We can't skip. Kardec said that there is not one vice or defect which does not more or less disfigure the sentiment of charity because all of them, the vices and defects, have their beginnings in selfishness and pride which are the negation of the sentiment of charity, of love. From this follows that the degree of perfection is in direct relation to the extent of this love. It was for this reason that Jesus, after having given his disciples the rules of charity and know that they contain of the most sublime, said to them, be perfect as your celestial father is perfect. And it was also for this reason that Paul struggled so restlessly to convince us all that the richest adornment for our spirits is the sentiment of love. Okay, thank you all.